In our third episode, we explore the world of diplomacy through the lens of Yi Min Wu, Regional Director for South and Southeast Asia at the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. Bringing over 15 years of diplomatic experience, she will uncover the art of negotiation in the realm of diplomacy. Welcome everyone to another podcast. We are now in Season 2, which is the Art of Negotiation, and we're very pleased today to have Wu Yimin. She is the Regional Director for South and Southeast Asia of the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. Uh, and uh, she just joined HD quite recently, 2022, uh, after more than 15 years in the public service, uh, in specifically in the foreign service. She was a diplomat representing Singapore in the UN, at WIPO, at WTO. Um, she's chaired UN negotiations. She's represented the group of 77 countries. And um, she writes books, conducts workshops that teach on negotiation and leadership in diplomacy specifically. So welcome, Yimin. Glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, such as to start, how how did you get involved in this whole, you know, working in the, the foreign service, in uh, diplomacy? Did you always dream of doing that when you were growing up? Oh, it's a very good question. I wanted to be a doctor and I guess I just didn't make it. <laughs> so I took, you know, science classes all the way through JC. Hmm. And then when I went to university, I decided to take a class in international relations and that converted me. I didn't realize that actually studying could be so fun. I wasn't falling asleep in class like I used to do in physics class. And and also, I th- for me, it's always been important to serve the world mm. in some way or another. And I used to think that's why it was med- medicine, right? And, you know, realizing that you could do it through diplomacy or by bringing people together through dialogue um, made me realize that perhaps that's where, where my path is. I didn't know that you can take international <laughs> relations at JC. That's that's interesting. It was a university. Yes. Oh, university. Yeah. Okay, right. right. Yeah. yeah, so that makes more sense. It's, it's like a like a class in there. And what, what drew you about that? Is it the idea that you could deal with people from different cultures? Is it the fact that you can travel the world? I mean, what, what really was it about? Or really just helping people? I think at a point in time, it was really about how we can serve, right? Mm. And I felt that, you know, if, if I don't have so that the medical tools, but if I can bring people together to find solutions, to build consensus, it doesn't matter from which country they come from, that to me was attractive. But to be honest, I didn't go straight into diplomacy either. When I came back, I started teaching. Mm-hmm. So in my first two years as a teacher, uh, I was sharing about what I was seeing outside. Right. right? Um, and through that experience, I realized that actually we can also help to shape the next generation to to build bridges, to also help give them the tools to de-escalate conflict because I think conflict is natural. Mm-hmm. What is not natural, what changes things is when people have arms, mm-hmm. right? Or when people don't have the tools to find the solutions to address the tensions between them. And so the more that we are able to give people those tools to manage conflict, mm. um, I think we actually have a more peaceful world. So, so that's a part that I want to touch on because... Um, for us, we primarily at Maxwell Chambers, we primarily deal with people from the commercial um, dispute resolution industry. Whereas for yours, I mean, this is diplomacy, international relations. So as you rightly pointed out, there's there's the element of conflict of that sort where you have violence and you have weapons, arms and all that. Besides the fact that the stakes are, of course, much higher, you know, you have communities that get displaced, you get people who lose their lives. Um, but does that also affect the way you conduct negotiation or is it broadly similar to how you would deal with a commercial dispute except, of course, the stakes are different? Sure, I think it's a very good question and I have limited experience in the commercial space. But from the what I have seen, I think the skill sets and the tools are largely the same. I think it's more that in the kind of negotiations we do, you probably take a lot more time. Um, you don't sit the conflict parties down within mm. a couple of days to resolve it. You want, really are looking for durable peace. Mm-hmm. And when it's durable peace, you spend a lot of, of effort trying to do conflict analysis, understanding what are the root causes, 
uh, you also identify who are the various stakeholders so that you can start setting up a more supportive environment towards whatever agreement that will come to play, right? And so maybe sometimes it's about identifying clan leaders who has got the trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's also sometimes not you mediating yourself, but actually training the local mediators to be able to find the solutions within them because they mm -hmm. are the trusted actors, right? right? Um, and I think... In terms of design process, there's just a lot of thought that goes into it. We call it AACCP, which is you have the actors, right? right? You think through um, the context because you also want to do no harm, you know? Um, sure. In, in, in the areas that we work in, if we don't understand what the community needs are, sometimes you can have adverse effects. So, okay. so that's that. Context. There's also uh, what we call content. So content is choosing what you actually want to mediate or negotiate. Right, and then P is the, the the process in which you go to in. So that would mean the sequencing. What do you decide to do first? Um, and it's never so linear per se. Like in when we were taught in commercial mediation, you have preconcepts, right, and then you move towards uh, the mediation process of identifying the agenda, yep. and then going to uh, looking at the interests and then the options. In this case pre consults can take a very long time and it, it can keep going, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you go into identifying the agenda, you know, sometimes, yes, you might say, okay, I, I can only resolve two or three issues. Right, um, right. And, and then maybe identifying other parties that can take on the other issues uh, that they might be addressing. Issues of, of interest will always come to, to, into play. The more you understand the parties, the more you're able to understand what their interests are. Right. And of course, when it comes to options generation, because sometimes there might be a political element to it, then timing becomes part of it, right? And so we, we talk about the ripeness in Fair mediation. Enough. You know, is this the right time? Do you have the sort of confluence of, of factors or maybe we know that it's not ripe and what you might just be doing is just fo focusing on the trust building sure until or laying a foundation exactly. for a, maybe a later period when the right people can take it all the way totally yes so we, we sometimes talk about it in in seasons I believe in you know mm. maybe our job might be to plant it might be to water or it might be to harvest sure. right uh, and we are not always there for the full season because of how long these mediation processes might take mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you're right that you know depending on on what the situation is somebody might take it on forward as, right. in, the, in the same way as building block right i mean that that's that's great um i noticed that that's one of the c's is context which I, I think it might differ in the commercial mediation uh, and, and arbitration spaces because when you have a commercial dispute, you generally focus on the interests of the two parties involved. You don't normally you know, talk about an outcome that has a wider impact on other people. It's not like, oh yeah, I, I need to also think about these other people who might be affected by our settlement. That's not the kind of language you tend to use. It's more like, okay, how does it affect us, the interests of the two parties? But here, because... Even if two sides agree on something, there may be a wider repercussion that you've got to also factor in to say that, you, you know, you can't just do this because then what about these other people who live in the same place or whatever? So that's, that's, that's I guess, another wrinkle that causes the process to be a bit more drawn out because there's a lot more things to juggle and, and to balance when you... Yes, and in fact, I would recommend people watching, there's a YouTube video um, of the Alexander Lecture by Toby Landau, who's mm -hmm. a very famous uh, QC, right. right? And last year he gave the CR lecture and he talked about how in, you know, investor state arbitration, mm -hmm. because I think the tribunals kind of depoliticize the issue or they narrow in on what the issue is, they don't always realize that there might be repercussions on the community. Yeah. Or for example, when the ar arbitral award is actually the same size of the IMF bailout of the country, yep. right? And yep. what happens there. So I think context should be important to any form of negotiation or mediation. Um, it's a question of maybe the extent, yep. right? And also building up awareness to just to know that whatever actions that we have could in a way, help or hurt someone right, else. Right. Yeah. No, I, th I think context is actually very important that maybe sometimes um, for lawyers in the commercial dispute resolution space, um, they're not used to looking at that because it's not something that the client wants and the other side doesn't care about, so why waste any bandwidth on it? But it's actually very important um, because it can actually explain or predict the path where something will go because all of these external factors remain at work even if you pretend they're not there. And I think one of the interesting things that we noticed in the past was 
um, there are places where when you're trying to enforce a foreign arbitral award against a local company, and you have to go before a local court to get it enforced in that place because the assets are found in that place. And then you have, you know, the court's not being very sympathetic to this. And then you think, ah, of course, you know, this is um, protectionism, nationalism, whatever label you want to put it for people who don't respect the rule of law, don't respect international practices, the judgment that was given by a tribunal somewhere else. You're just here to protect your countrymen. That's, that's the kind of, you know, very negative perception that the lawyers will have when they try to fight this, right? But the context in this case is, if the size of the amount that you're trying to get enforced against this particular company will effectively bankrupt this company, and this company employs half of the village, you're basically asking a judge who lives in that place and knows the people who live there to, to sign off on something that will effectively destroy his hometown. It's something he won't take lightly. You know, no matter what you think he ought to do, the fact remains that it's a huge decision, it's a weighty decision. And I think that's the part sometimes that context is missing and people feel yeah. like you're just being difficult or you just don't understand the law, you know, some provincial judge. But really what's playing on their minds is this decision could be the end of our life, yes. our way of life as we know it. And that's something which I think um, maybe sometimes we as lawyers need to give a bit more weight to that in the way we conduct ourselves in dispute resolution processes. And which is why I'm very inspired by the state courts here in Singapore mm -hmm. because it's reading about how they have now brought together various processes including therapeutic justice. Yes, that's right. And mediation. For family disputes. Exactly, yeah. because at the end of the day, yes, you know, law is important and you're not asking the lawyers to be, you know, um, counsellors, mm. but you're asking for them to understand the context so you're not driving a deeper wedge between the parties. Mm -hmm. So there's greater, I guess, healing, right, mm -hmm. as part of the process so that the outcome is durable. Right. I, I think one of the my frustrations, I suppose, when I was negotiating out in the UN and elsewhere was that it's you're taking on so much blood, sweat and tears, right, and even political goodwill to try to forge these agreements between yep. uh, over 190 countries. But to what extent did we really understand what were the needs on the ground? Uh -huh. Did we build ownership of mm -hmm. these outcomes? Because otherwise, these would just be very fancy pieces of paper that are filed into a, a file cabinet somewhere if yep. people don't own it, yep. right? And also, ultimately, if you don't have that ownership, then whatever carrots and sticks that you put into that agreement, you know, it, it will only go so far. Yep. And at some point, the question is, you know, will they implement it? And so one of the things that we, we are taught in mediation is, is inclusion. So inclusion really means, you know, bringing together the actors that might be affected, mm -hmm. understanding, you know, where they are coming from. It's also about making sure that your process is adaptable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that you're not just fixed on this is what the route. It's also about how you look at the, the process so that it's about bringing the parties closer together rather than moving them further apart as a right. result right. of what you're going through. That's right, yeah. No, I mean, ultimately, the point of dispute resolution processes is that you want the other side, presumably, to do something, to behave a certain way or to do something or to stop doing something. But the trouble is, if you don't have the right tools to, to effect that, you don't have the right way of getting it done, you end up resorting to... Things like, okay, you know, this is the agreement and if you don't, I'm going to, you know, smack you in court. I'm going to find a way. Where, what's the point of all that if you could find a way to get them on board in the first place such that you don't have to employ any of these tools, you know, any punitive measures, but you just find that they are happy with the outcome and they'll just go and do it themselves, which is which is the outcome you want anyway, right? Yes. Um, so, so I think maybe sometimes, you know, dispute resolution becomes unnecessarily difficult because we're not using the right tools or the right approach. Um, like they say, you know, if you only have a hammer in your toolbox, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so you start to just hammer everything when actually, no, there are better ways to achieve this. And I think that sometimes... Um, what we are also seeing in the, the ADR space for the legal industry where um, the traditional idea in most people's minds of what lawyers do when there's a dispute is they, I'll see you in court, right? And then yeah. it's been, of course, overly dramatized by a cultural, you know, kind of you know, popular culture and, you know, where you see shows and things like that. Um, but really, that's not always the best way. In fact, that's usually the worst outcome you can get where even if you win the case, um, you probably damage the relationship. Exactly. And and I always tell people, 
if you are having a commercial dispute, this is not a tort case. This is not someone who dropped the brick off the building and hit you, you know, or, or scratched your car by accident. This is where you actually at some point had a business relationship and it didn't work out. But before all this happened, you thought this person was worth going to business with. So why are you now saying that, forget it, I'm going to burn all my bridges, I don't ever want to work with you again? Um, especially in small industries, you can't afford to do that. Because your credibility and your reputation. credibility matters. And there may only be a few options anyway. If you don't work with this person, you're going to have to go with your second best choice, right. which you didn't go with originally, right? So so I always find sometimes some of these approaches to dispute resolution a little bit short-sighted. It's, it's almost like a, um, you know, like a, like a scorched earth approach where I, <laughs> I burn the ground so that you have no choices left except the one I want, which is really silly. Um, but it's a, it reflects a short-term mindset that I will win this case and who cares about what happens after that, especially that's my client's problem, not mine, yeah. um, which I think is counterproductive in the long run. And I think, you know, even if it was a, a, a case of where the two of us stayed uh, as HDB neighbours, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And I play, you know, Taylor Swift into the late of the night and then you, you complain and you take me to court, right? And you might win the case, but tomorrow I'll be putting my plants in front of your house to block right, you, right? or whatever, so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you're, you're right. You, we need to be looking at the long game, right? And what will actually be sustainable? What will heal the relationship and also help our own credibility and reputation going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, because which, which is, I mean, the question in this particular scenario you just gave is, do I want you to stop playing Taylor Swift? Even though I don't mind listening to it. Oh, it's my wife <laughs> did you go to the too much. No, I didn't. My wife did. I didn't get a ticket. So she went with her friends. But anyway, that's a whole separate podcast. Um, but do I want you to behave responsibly as, you know, more considerately as a neighbor? Or do I want you to stop playing Taylor Swift? Because then that's a very narrow outcome that is quite silly because then you could play something else like exactly. drums, all right? Yes. Um, so, so... But, but I think maybe one of the problems is that when a dispute reaches a certain level, people stop thinking and acting rationally and they become very emotional, especially when there's a, there's a grievance that's also introduced where you betrayed me or you said things that were uncalled for or you humiliated me. And all these things oh, now yes. get wrapped into a very complicated bundle where you can't separate anymore the rational way forward from the fact that I feel that I need to be vindicated or I worse, I feel that you need to feel my pain. Oh, yeah. And that, that drives a lot of these very difficult kinds of negotiations. Do you guys encounter that? Yeah, because we work in Mindanao, um, especially on Rido. Ah. So Rido is what we call clan conflict, okay. right? And these clan feuds, you know, between the communities can easily result in, you know, outbursts of violence and in one particular case where a father and a son were killed, you know, for six years, the kids couldn't go to school, right? Because of the firefight. Um, and for the parents, they had to walk an extra 10 to 15 kilometers uh, wow. because they couldn't go through certain areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was unsafe. And so, you know, you needed the trained mediators to do the shadow diplomacy or shadow mediation to do the conflict mapping. Mm-hmm. And they managed to resolve the case, not and the the success story wasn't just the fact that kids were able to go back to school and parents uh, were able to go back to work and the displaced were able to return home, but that one of the warlords himself became a mediator. Right. right? And so wow. I think it's you are very right that conflict happens and sometimes people, you know, whether it's an issue of jealousy, might be issue of land or property or just, you know, you hurt my feelings in some way. And if it's not managed Mm -hmm. because they don't have the tools to de-escalate themselves or you don't have a local mediator who's trained to be able to do that, right? Then it can easily become a much bigger incident with spillover effects for the whole community. But what does it take to be that person on the ground? I mean, that, that sounds like an extremely difficult role. Uh, which which comes with personal risks. I mean, you're 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 talking about people who were shot and killed, and yes. people can't go to school because of the threat, right? Because of firearms and stuff. And you're saying now this person has to be like an emissary shuttling between two groups. Where what if you don't like the offer that was brought, and they say, well, I'm going to shoot the messenger to send a message to the other side. I mean, what kind of person would you need to be able to do that kind of role? So, you know, that's why I have a lot of respect for the peacemakers that we train on mm-hmm. the ground because it takes courage, 
right? And many of them come from the communities I themselves. See. And so they, there is that want and desire to bring back peace to the people around them. Okay. So, and they come from all over. Some of them are, might be a clan leader. Another one that I know of was a professor in computer science, right? Okay. But through the training and the mediation tools that we give them, and now we have brought them together through a community of practice. That means we brought together all the sort of local mediators mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. we've been working with. We, and we held the Bangs Moro Mediators Forum recently where they all came together. So these are opportunities for them to learn from each other, to be able right. to say, okay, you know, what worked or what didn't work in this case. I mean, they're fascinating stories. Like one of them was talking about how, you know, there was a rift between two parties and because the owner of a, of a, of a home couldn't return back to what he saw was his, his property. Mm-hmm. And the person that was staying in that property was a judge, right? And so no amount of you know, <laughs> negotiation before that was, you know, helped solve the problem. And so one of the local mediators, you know, uh, he decided to do a conflict mapping. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he walked across that property and sort of said, oh, you know, this is a really nice place to live. And, you know, I, I wish that I moved here too. And then that that judge said, "Oh, actually, this is not my property." So you know, he he admitted it to the okay. mediator that it wasn't his property. But then, through sort of discussions and understanding the the context, we realized that this particular judge didn't want to deal with the owner because the spokesperson for the woman, spokesperson for the the home, had been a woman, and he didn't want to deal with, see. with the woman because he said that. She didn't have the right of the property. It okay. should have been the husband okay. or, or somebody else. And uh, so it was through understanding all of that that he actually managed to figure out right what the solution looked like, mm, how mm. do you bring them together, and how to then cre- to de-escalate the entire community because it became a community right, problem. Right, okay. right? Um, but that's just one of many examples. You know, the, the, you talked about how the... Because they have arms, it is dangerous, right? And which is why they do shuttle mediation to start. You know, in commercial mediation, you put the two parties together in yeah, the same yeah. room at top. But because they have arms, it's important often at the very beginning where you do not put the parties in the same room um, uh, as a, because you could easily escalate into a firefight, right? Of course, of course. And so, you know, apart from the sort of training in mediation, there's, we also tr- uh, train them in security precautions. Okay. Um, but we don't... We're not the UN. We don't have a security detail or protocol. And, and you might not want to because, again, yeah. it sends a very wrong message. Yes. Like when you come in with with a strong armed force, it suggests that I don't trust you and this is my backup plan, which, of course, the person doing it might feel a bit safer because you've got all these blue helmets around you. But the people who are receiving it might be offended to say that, look, look you came under a like a flag of truce as as a negotiator, um, why can't you trust that we will respect that, that you've got safe passage in and out? The fact that you have to bring an armed force means that you don't trust us. And then right away, you already start off on a bad foot, isn't it? Yeah, so I think it's not easy either way because, you know, for a lot of aid workers, even whether you, whether you have security protocol or you don't have security protocol, the people can still get harmed. Oh, of course, right? of course, yeah. And so often it's really about how do you forge the trust with the parties beforehand. Sure. Maybe having someone that can represent you before mm. or that can recommend you. So it is very courageous work. It's also just a it lot does. of time, right, and yeah. effort. No, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no right answer for this because as, as you pointed out there are also the fact that it's just a lawless area sometimes and you need that protection not from the party that you're going to meet yeah. but someone that you run into before you even meet the party who has promised you protection once you're in their territory but you know until you get there things could be a bit dicey so so I, I get that um, and, and especially in areas where the law and order has broken down, oh, then yes. it becomes increasingly complicated because no one is in control of it at all, whether you know you have bandits and pirates and all that, on top of the fact that they're warring you know, factions. Exactly, and, and whether you have trust over the legal system. Yeah, right, right. Right, you know, in some of these places, they don't actually trust the local administrators mm-hmm. or because it, they represent or what they symbolize, right? It might be a, a different party. That's right, yeah. So. Or, or someone who we see as oppressors, a majority race that has always treated us badly as minorities. So even now, you know, I, I'm not even sure that they will live up to their word and stuff like that. So so, so it's, it's, a, it's a really demanding kind of thing. Why, why 
<laughs> do you want to do this? I mean, besides the fact that you want to serve, there are many ways to serve. But, you know, you can... But, but I suppose it starts off with the fact that in Singapore, we're very blessed. Okay. Right? I have two kids. They've never had issues going to school, mm-hmm. right? You know, they, we have access to health care. Right. And ultimately, I think those who are blessed with peace, right, it's also our kind of duty okay. to be able to help others who don't. And that camera scope, he was formerly the UN Secretary General. He said that, you know, you can serve your country and serve the world. So it's not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think there are many things that as Singaporeans, we have been taught, like at the UN, we are great peacemakers and, and mediators. Mm-hmm. You look at, you know, many of our diplomats that have gone out yep. there and have forged agreements, Ambassador Tomiko, yep. you know, Ambassador Burhan Gafur, Ambassador Rina Lee, and, and, and many of the others who don't even have the ambassadorship title and, sure. and stories that, you know, we, that, that there's out there. And so how can we use that, right, and to to be able to help others? And, and, out, and I think what we also see is that Conflict ultimately spills over. Sure. Right. So whether it's through the scam centers or trafficking, of that course, might yeah. See, yeah, or how it affects inflation and uh, supply chains, and so we can sometimes kind of close up and say, okay, you know, it's not my business, you know, it's someone else's. But the truth is that. It, it comes back mm-hmm. in some way or another. No, I, I love that. I mean, on one hand, you could say that, well, this is not altruistic. Singapore does things because we we are small and we live in a neighborhood where things that go wrong will ultimately affect us. And even if it's just the idea that free trade becomes a factor, you know, um, that's, that's a reason to already get involved. But I like the fact that you're doing it personally because it's more than just all of that. It's just a sense of it's the right thing to do. It's, it's the thing that you do because you look at what we have and you look at what everyone else around may or may not have and you say, how can I make a difference so that I don't just sit and rest on on all of the comforts and blessings that I have in this country, um, knowing what I know about what's going on around in the rest of the world, um, if I can make a difference to at least a small part of the world, um, maybe that's what I should do. And, and I, I love that because I think um, a lot of times um, I keep hearing that as a repeated theme in a lot of the people who are in the dispute resolution space right. uh, from other people who are mediators, um, you know, that, that the the joy that they get from a successful resolution between parties, especially in family cases, far outweighs any fees that they could charge for it. It's just a sense of, um, you know, I keep hearing this as a repeated theme. Mediators who mediate a family conflict that was intractable, the family just yeah. going to be torn apart. And after that, people are crying and hugging and then they all take turns to hug the mediator because it's almost like, I'm so grateful you literally saved my family. Yeah. How do you how do you measure something like that? How do you how do you put that out and say, yeah, no, my bank balance looks great because five people hugged me today. You know, it's a totally different kind of feeling, and that's what I suppose drives many of you who are doing this, I, despite I, the risk. Personally, course, you know, of course. And you know, I for those who have come to me for career advice or questions about you know journey, I always say that there's four parts, mm-hmm. right? One is purpose. What is your purpose? Mm-hmm. You know, if Sometimes for people, okay, my, my purpose might be to help in terms of health because that's, you know, uh, where what I care about. It might be a, another area of trade or economics. So one is being clear about what that might be. Mm. The second one is values. So if the values wasn't wouldn't just be about the organization and what they write on their website, but it's really about the values of the people that you're working with. Mm-hmm. You know, you're working with your tribe, so right. to speak. Yeah. And then the third one is skill sets, right? So what are the skills for which you can best use and contribute because we're all gifted with with different skills and so how can i build that up and also at the same time mitigate my weaknesses Mm. right like like don't give me an excel sheet you know there's there's certain things that i'm you know i'm not good at and then the fourth one is priorities like where do you want to be in the season of your life right right and so it might be maybe you want to be located in a certain certain place it might be that you prefer a non a non desk job and to be out in the field, and so I think through identifying these four areas, mm-hmm. that helps you to figure out where you best fit, and and it no longer becomes a job. Sure. And so I think you find that people who do this kind of work in terms of mediation is just very strong purpose. Mm-hmm. They often are part of a community who they see it's like their tribe. Sure. They know what their skill sets are, and then often priorities is probably local because of, of wanting to bring peace to to their families as mm. well, right? And so I think, as I said, just for me, being very aware of these four helps in identifying next steps. But also going back to the point about Singapore, you know, when I was at the WTO, 
we tabled a resolution for countries not to impose export restrictions mm-hmm. on World mm-hmm. Food Programme's humanitarian uh, purchases. Right, right. 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 And it's not because Singapore benefits from these humanitarian purchases by the WFP. We are, we're not a recipient. Mm-hmm. But because this was the period of the pandemic, yeah. and we felt that this could be a contribution that could actually help to elevate hunger levels and what was happening in terms of the humanitarian crisis. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we, t- we lobbied 160 countries and managed to get an, an outcome, right? And so it goes back to, to this question of, it's, is it because we did it to serve a particular Singaporean agenda? The answer is no. There was, no, yeah. You know, we given the amount of work that we had to put in, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, it, it was just because we believe that if you have a seat at the table, it's a privilege. Yeah. Right? We use More than that, it's a responsibility. Them. Exactly. You know, I completely agree. You know, that, that's why you hear it in like movies and stuff, right? When great power comes great responsibility. So a, a seat at the table is power because yes. you have a chance to change the outcome of things. Then therefore, how do you use that, that seat responsibly? I totally agree, right? It's, it's a responsibility issue. And I think when we take that on, and, and it's not just about being at the UN. Anyone mm. who has the privilege to be at a negotiation table or right. to be able to, to, to speak in a place that others don't have that opportunity to do so, we should use it well. Yeah. No, it's interesting because uh, unfortunately, a lot of my worldview is shaped by, um, you know, pop culture terribly. <laughs> uh, so, like, like this whole phrase of great power, uh, you know, comes with great responsibility. is It's very much synonymous with Spider Man. Uh, okay. And and they paraphrased it in the Marvel version of it, where Tom Holland's character says something along the lines of, "If you can do the things I can do, and you don't do it, and then bad things happen." They happen because of you. It's a very interesting way of paraphrasing it to say that that you could have done something and you didn't. So when the bad things happen, you can't then absolve yourself from the responsibility because you stood aside to let it happen in a way. That's that's kind of how it's phrased. And I guess having a seat at the table, that's that's the kind of weight on you. You know, like like they say, the you know the, the heavy is the crown that lies on your head because it's it's your fault if things go wrong because you could have done something and you chose not to, rather than you, you, you tried and you failed. That's a different thing. Right. But you, you chose not to, and then bad things happen. Which is why I think that this role of peacemaker, you don't need to to just be a professional mediator, mm. right? It's also about you know students learning mediate, mediation skills as mm-hmm. part of, kind of peer-to-peer solutioning. Right. And it's also about learning how to do it so that you can de-escalate some of the conflict you might see in families uh, or doing it in, in the workplace yep. environment. Yep. I don't need the capital M on me, right? Yeah, right. You know, it's more about if we can help others to find solutions and we can help to generate what we call options, right? Mm-hmm. Um I think all of that would actually make our world a little bit better. So is it about world peace, global peace? I mean, yes, I think idealistically we hope that those can be achieved. But the fact is that we can build communities of peace. Yeah. That has been done and we can do more in that regard. Well, I mean, world peace is not like a switch that you turn on and off. It is whether collectively people want to choose to make little sacrifices for the sake of the other people. Because if the whole world is filled with people who only do what's in their own interest, that's how conflict arises. When you have a scarcity of resources, when you have things that some people want and other people you know, have it, um, when you act in pure self-interest, that's how conflict arises. Because I want that, or I want you to share that, and you're not doing it, so I'm just going to take it by force. So, so yeah, I, I think sometimes we, we like to use labels that are very big, like world peace, but they don't mean anything in, yeah. in just a vacuum. They, they really, when you drill down to it, it really means everybody acting with a little bit of a sense of there are some things which I need to accept that there's a give and take in life so that we can coexist harmoniously, uh, whether in the micro level, like between our neighbours and the person blasting Taylor Swift at night, <laughs> or in the macro level where nations and ethnic groups recognise that some have more than others. It's, it's just how it is. You know, you can't argue that if you are living on a mountaintop, your your options are much more limited than you're living next to a river. But that doesn't give you a reason to say, then I'll come down with with weapons and just, you know, right. slash and burn and take whatever I want. Right? So so I think that's that's the part that makes, I suppose, your job really interesting because 
there's always these dynamics that are at play, but the scenarios are always very varied and different. That, that you never get bored of the fact that this is a new problem that is, well, it's an old problem, but it's wrapped up in a very new version of it and a new group of people. And, and that makes it interesting for you to want to say, how can I help? What can I do? Yeah. And you see this especially with when you talk about scarcity of resources, mm-hmm. right? With climate change. Yeah. This question of, you know, climate and conflict, is, it's been, there's lots of data out there that talks about how climate change actually exacerbates existing conflict. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at, say, you know, some of the, the common seas and common natural resources that we have out there, if there's a depletion of, of fish stocks, yep. right, it starts creating problems in terms of livelihoods yep. for the various countries yep. around it. You also have issues of, of food security, mm-hmm. but also then clashes between, you know, the fishermen who are going out further out to fish, yep. right, with maritime enforcement agencies. That's right. Yep. You know, so these are things that we need, we are, we're already working on and, and, and talking about. You also see in, in the Sahel, which is really happening, the fight over water resources, Yes. right? And so, you know, herd farmers, you know, tr- going going to the, the watering hole and realizing that actually, you know, there's very little water and, and a fight or conflict, you know, erupts. And so are, are we trained? Are, are we prepared for what is to come mm-hmm. as a result of this scarcity of resources? Do we have that resilience? And I think when we talk about climate change, we talk about, you know, mitigation as well as adaptation in terms of how many seawalls we can build. But there's a limit, yeah. I think, to yeah. how many seawalls we will right, be able yeah. to build. So, so I think part of adaptation is also building up the resilience of us as people sure. to be able to resolve some of these conflicts that are already happening or is to come. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean the, the, the problem here, I think, is that the scarcity of resources thing that drives a lot of the conflict uh, is very often, I feel, dismissed in the developed world as a, as a third world problem because we don't face scarcity of of resources, so to speak. But that's not true at all. I mean, you, you think of like, oh, you know, fishermen fighting, right? So it must be some, some you know, very agrarian rural societies. But no, the French and the, and the English are fighting over fishing in the North Sea. Yeah. These are two extremely wealthy developed countries and yet fishing is a, is a source of conflict. In the US, Colorado River is drying up. Entire states are fighting over their allocation of water because the upstream states are taking more and more because they're upstream. Then the downstream states are saying, you know, you're sending us a trickle and, and that's killing our, our farms and everything. So, so it's a real problem that I think um, has the potential to destabilize even pre-existing peaceful neighbors. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think some of the studies really show what will happen in Southeast Asia as well, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's so many so many communities here who are vulnerable to sea levels rising and as a result of that it's going to affect both co- displacements of communities as well as you know natural resources, you know from water and and, and others. So you're right, and we might seem peaceful or mainly peaceful, but the question is you know, when when the scarcity hits, yeah. what happens? Yeah, I mean, everyone's friends when times are good. Exactly. But yes. then you see the true characters when things go badly. Well, well, this has been fascinating. We're running out of time, but I want to end with a personal question, as I do for all of my podcasts. Um, so, Don't ask me my favorite band. <laughs> no, no, what continue. is your favorite band, <laughs> out of curiosity? No, I was going to say that, you know, I... I, when we talk about Taylor Swift, I, 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 I'm not a Swifty, and I know that that, that might... <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just a name that is easily recognized by people, right? Yes, and, uh, but at, at the same time, you know, my, but my kids love it, and they, okay. they've been, you know, dancing to it. So maybe, maybe I might be converted in time. But yes, tell so, me your personal question. Right, okay. So if, if there is someone uh, from the past or present uh, in the world who has been a diplomat or a public figure, a uh, renowned negotiator of some sort... Uh, that you could sit down and have coffee with um, that you currently can't. I mean, it's not someone that's already on speed dial, right? A, a person that you haven't had coffee before and you would love to. Who would this person be? It would be Mr. Kofi Annan, right? I have always been fascinated and intrigued by how he mediated the Kenyan political crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, he looked at how it was important to prevent forum shopping. And then I would love to kind of sit there and dissect it with him. What was the design process? How right. did he sequence his mediation process? You know, when who were the kind of actors that he decided to bring into the room? Who did, who did he decide to leave out of the room? And then kind of what 
what happened sort of post agreement to ensure durability of that peace. I think that's that's one just one part of it. But the second part of it is the fact that there aren't as many well known mediators from developing countries sure. not because they don't exist. It's just that people don't talk about them, right? right? And so the question is, how could we build up and empower mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. more sort of mediators coming out from Asia, Africa? Because we there are so many skill sets, and mm-hmm. I, I believe that again, this could be this could be something that we can share around the world. You know, could we? Maybe we'll be working with um, some of these countries to build up a, a mediation network or community mm-hmm. in based out in Asia. I mean, there's master pr- masters programs out in Europe or on the US, and all of that is good and important. But how about sort of political or community mediation programs where we where we show the skill sets great also idea, yeah. um, in in Asia. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a great way to end. Coffee with coffee. Yes, so, I like the pun. <laughs> thank you so much, Yimin. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we wish you all the best in all you're doing. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you.